I have strange cats trying to. Whoop. Um, we're John. <laughs> Hi, everybody. We just went over this. <laughs> we're so glad you guys are all with us again for a fantastic virtual tasting here on Facebook. Um, tonight, we're really excited. This is a real treat. I'm, I'm really excited to go over this wine. This is our 2014 Raven. So this is one that, man, people haven't gotten to see this wine come out of the, the cellar in a long time. And it's definitely one of my favorites. And I know it's very near and dear to everybody's heart. If you've been a, with Becker, or been a customer or a wine club member for, for very long, the Raven is definitely one of those that everybody truly loves and really likes to, to revisit. So I'm really glad we're, we're gonna open this one tonight. Hopefully you've had it decanting for a little bit as, since it is a 2014. Um, tonight, we've got John Leahy, our winemaker. We also have Dr. Joseph Becker with us. And I'm gonna stay on for the duration of the broadcast as well. So we discuss this fantastic wine. I'm gonna kick it over to the gentleman to get us started. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, Rebecca. Cheers. Thank you for that yeah, great introduction. Sorry, I started talking over when we went live. I was saying some crazy cat was trying to climb up the window behind me. <laughs> anyway, uh, exactly. Um, it happens when you have 500 cats. So Joe, uh, would you like to lead us off with a few words, sir? Sure, I, I, um, I think what I'd like to say is that um, doing just doing a lot of uh, um, thinking you know, we, we continue to keep our tasting room closed. Um, and, you know, what that comes from is that, um, you know, we, my, obviously my father and I are both physicians uh, and we, um, you know, my mother always wanted people to come to our winery and to feel like they were part of our family. And so we, we see all of our, we see our employees, we see our people that come and taste as, as part of our family and, and we want to keep everybody as safe as we can. And, um, and so we, you know, we will continue to do that and, and um, just for the safety of everyone else. But with that said, I am, I am really excited to taste the 2014 Anc de Calmar tonight. Uh, so I just, I have to, I have to say, and I, and I know my, oh I was told in my videos, were, am I, am I, uh, am I okay? Yes, sir. You're fine. Okay. okay. Uh, so just just uh, the origin the origin of this wine uh, is um, initially um, my family had been to a, um, uh, a wine trip to Argentina to Mendoza um, you know which is a famous area of making Malbec and Malbec was uh, you know is one of the five principal red Bordeaux grapes and. Um, in 1956, there was a major frost that, that wiped out 75% of the uh, Malbec crop in Bordeaux. And so um, it came back a little bit. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and, but, but, <laughs> but there have been some uh, interesting planting, plantings in, in the New World, particularly in Argentina, uh, where, where uh, Malbec is grown. And so my, my, my family had been on a trip, and one day we were blending wines. I, I think our first Raven had to be 07, I think. And um, my, my mom, we were tasting Malbec and my mom said, you know, they make these wonderful, rich, dark Malbec blends in Argentina. We should be able to do that here in Texas. And uh, so our, our previous winemaker, um, Russell Smith, made up a blend of uh, Malbec and Petit Verdot. And um, my father, the, the, the tasting goes around the table. So there, there, our tasting crew, you know, our, our morning tasting were my father, myself, my mom, uh, Brett, our general manager, um, previously Russell. And uh, my mom said, gosh, this is, this is just dark and, um, and, and rich. And my father said, yes, yeah, dark and rich. Uh, it's like squid ink. Let's call the wine off to Kalmar. Uh, and as, as I've heard the story, there was a slight pause and to, after which my mother said, hell no, uh, or, or probably something worse. But um, so they came up with the idea of, of Raven as um, something that, you know, to, to describe a wine that's dark and mysterious. It has some other uh, interesting meanings. One of them is that uh, Raven was the Native American name for Sam Houston. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that became sort of an important name for us. Yeah. And um, and I think I'm, I, you know, this was, <clears throat> this is a, I believe one of our masterpieces as a wine, this 14. I know John, you're gonna talk about it more, but I just, I have to brag, John, you did an incredible job with this. Uh, this is, 
This was the uh, year that we won four double golds in the San Francisco International Wine Competition, including a double gold for this wine. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, we did. We, we did very well. We, we had a, a rather co very, quite a few stellar years with, with these awards. Um, you know, but you could have blown me over with a feather. You actually had a winemaker before me. <laughs> <laughs> I think about it like the drummers in Spinal Tap. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Oh my God. That's it. I'm doomed. Well, here's the one eye, one armed one. That's great. Well, listen, I want everybody at home to either put on Spinal Tap or join us for a glass of wine. Uh, so, um, this is uh, the 2014 Raven. I, I would love everybody, if, you, if you're joining us right now, it is the 2014 Raven we're tasting. Uh, we're gonna dive right into it, but I want everybody to give it a couple of swirls, a sniff and a taste. I decanted this wine about a little over an hour ago now. Um, I had it chilling and decanted and it's, I, I have to tell you, I was, and uh, Rebecca, uh, cue to you, I was actually trying them in a couple of different glasses, the, what I call my Psalm glass. But it really, this nice 33 ounce bowl Bordeaux glass, this does so well in this one. Yeah, I, I ended really... up I ended up uh, preferring it in the Cab Merlot glass myself, the, the larger Cab Merlot glass. That, and I tried it in the in the Syrah glass and I tried it in what you call the Somme glass, which is more like a Pinot Noir style. Right, right, I tried right. it in all three and I really preferred it myself in this, this Cabernet Merlot glass. Oh, I do too. So um, what are your impressions? Give it a smell. I want, I want to take this a little slow just for a couple of minutes if you guys will bear with me. So I want you each to give a smell, tell me what's on the nose and then we'll come back and visit the taste. So Rebecca, I'm going to start with you, of course, because um, I love putting you on the hot seat. So what, what do you get in the nose? So one of the things that I really like um, in the way that this wine ages is that it gives that, I know people kind of look sideways at me when I say this, but that it's this sort of forest floor, sort of musty, but in a really good way, you know, that, that, that is really what I get first. Um, and then there's a little bit of spice, almost like an anise, maybe. Mm -hmm. Listen, you using fancy spices. I'm trying, <laughs> trying to up my game, John. And that's really what I get on the nose. Um, but that sort of forest floor, that sort of um, just kind of earthiness. I really, I really enjoy that expression as the wines start to age. I see that come out a lot more, and I really enjoy that. Good. So, so Joe, uh, what it, what are you getting, sir, in the nose? I get. Um, I agree with Rebecca, and I and I get very dark, um, almost. Not quite, you know, close to dark chocolate, um, maybe, maybe current. Um, and as you say, you know, these wines are known uh, in the new world, as I understand it, for, for releasing some of the phenolic compounds that you talk about. And I get, I get a little bit of that when I, when I first smell it. It's, a, it's, not, um, it's, not, it's not quite perfumey, but it's, a, it's, a, it's very rich. Mm -hmm. It is. I, you know, I love the anise edge there that uh, Rebecca was describing. And the forest floor, the, the almost like the leaf matter, you know, when you crunch through that, that really nice, rich, earthy smell on there, there definitely is a deeper, uh, uh, deeper toasted note, a deeper earth note in here. But what I really find surprising is the dusty herb in the back. Yeah. Not, you know, it's more of a, a savory, not a, not a brown spice, like a sweeter edge, like cinnamon or nutmeg or anything like that. It's more savory um, and very, very deep. I, almost a turmeric edge, a fresh turmeric to thyme edge. Um, but yeah, it, this, the 2014 is incredible. So let's, let's give it a taste and let's uh, see what our palates hold up to. Oh man. So smooth. Mm. Yeah, that, that. Um, okay, Rebecca, what are you getting? So I, it's interesting. I get some actually some fruits on the palate. I get almost like a, a plum, but not like a fresh ripe plum. Does that makes sense. Mm -hmm. it's not like a stewed plum. I don't know something maybe cooked a little bit, but plum okay. is in there somewhere. Yes. Um, and then it's the mouthfeel is very velvety. It's 
the finish mm -hmm. on it is just so smooth and and just like caresses your mouth as you finish this wine. It's just it's spectacular, Doc. Yes, I agree. So what are, what are you getting on the palate, Joe? I've I've always I mean I'm just um, the, the 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 tannin the tannins and this the tannin structure in this wine um, is is pretty incredible and that, and that's uh, as I understand it another another trait of, of New World Malbec that we get we get these beautiful tannins that have really held up over time and I agree with Rebecca I mean it's it's got a very it's I think velvety is the absolute right adjective for the mouthfeel for the finish. Um, it's 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 and and there's still in a little bit of a niece still on the on the palate as well. Yeah, I um sorry, I'm going back because mine mine is warming up, so it's 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 starting to really come out of the chill. I had it slightly too chilled, probably about 40 to 50 degrees when I first put it in the decanter here. Um, so it's it's coming up, but I it it's fun to me because this this older wine, this 2014, we did get the double gold. Um, for that and, and very, very proud of that. Um, but to me, uh, it has become so much better in the bottle over the last few years, uh, you know, taking it out of the cellar. And, and I was very, um, so I actually put this on the menu for the cruise in November of the Danube. So uh, the wine club cruise. So we're gonna, we're gonna have another opportunity for those folks to taste it. I understand if it goes through, but we still have to plan as if. But um, I was pretty excited that we had enough in the background, not only to do this tasting, but to kind of supply for a couple of special dinners. So it's really come about. I would love to try this wine in another five years, to tell you the truth. I think this is going to be a, a stellar wine. Um, and I think, I think, I think, John, um, it's important for, for people that don't know what it means to get a double goal in the San Francisco competition, meaning uh, you, have, you have 64 judges. Uh, all industry peers, as I understand it, um, you know, all people with very knowledgeable palates and very all 64 of those. Yeah, exactly. You know, Heidi Barrett, I know, is one of the judges um, and all 64 of those judges have to independently give the wine a gold medal. And right. so for us to get four of those that year was pretty unheard of. But they, they have three different, they, they go through three different times. So it, it, that one is a, a really intense. When you get a double gold on that one, you, you, you've got something to be very proud of. Um, so they, they do, each judge has three different times to taste this and grade it. So you've got, um, it's basically saying you got a perfect score because that's the only way to get it is to have a perfect score. So we got four of them in one year, you know, from that same competition. So, um, you know, um, pretend this is a mic. <laughs> Well, and on that note, because that was something that was rather unheard of, um, we got a fair amount of press in the wine industry, and that's kind of brought about the fact that we then were informed that we were no longer allowed to call our wine raven, and so we had to come up with a different name, which is why we have a lot of people that question, where's the raven? What happened to it? We still have it. It's just now called You know what? Come and get it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm feeling a little cantankerous. Clearly, harvest has started. <laughs> so, he steps in, and I'm raring to go. <laughs> John, I'm curious about the I'm, I'm curious about the oak profile in this. So it's got, and I don't know you'll talk about the blend, but uh, I'd, I'd be. I'd, I'd be curious to hear that. Well, the, the oak profile um, we did on, so both of the Malbec components in here saw a fair amount of new oak that year. In 2014, um, I was playing with uh, things. We did not really have um, a barrel budget to speak of in 2014. Um, <laughs> so anytime, any that joke never gets any old. Chance, any, any chance I get. Um, so anyway, we did, we had a fair barrel budget. But we did, um, we had a fair amount of American oak. In 14, we actually was the year that we actually took an increase in our French oak program. So, um, you know, we almost, well, we went up by almost 50% that year in the French oak as far as the amount that we were buying in. So it enabled me to use um, new French oak on some of the uh, more spectacular red wine lots of ours and, and as well as the white wine. So for those of you who, 
are just tuning in or are not sure what we're talking about. So the Oak program is the barrels. I, I classify barrels by brand new that year that we buy them and then one year old and then neutral. Um, so uh, neutral is anything two years old or older. Um, the, or as far as two vintages old or older. Uh, they, some people classify it differently. Anyway, with, with new oak, I try not to, any given wine blend by the end of it, we're generally under 20% new oak in anything. That's uh, a general rule of thumb. There are a couple of wines that saw more. This Raven is one of them. So it broke the rule of thumb. We were almost 30% new oak in this Raven. Um, but it was in barrel for two full years before we bottled it. And we blended it and then went back to barrel with it. That was one of the first major changes I made um, on that program. Um, it aged again for another six months, I think, or five or six months before we went, went to bottle with it. So um, you've tasted it a couple of times. So uh, curious, um, what do you think? Holding up to the nose? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What what is the percent blend on this, John? So the the blend percentage, um, of course, it's 100% 2014, 100% Texas. Um, just because there are people still out there going, I didn't know you made Texas wine. I'm like, buddy, we're the largest <laughs> maker of Texas wine in Texas, uh, or outside of Texas, for that matter. Um, in, the <laughs> in the universe. There you go. So the the Malbec is 60% uh, of the blend. Okay. Of that 60%. Um, of the overall blend, 50% of the Malbec came from Drew Talent's vineyard up in Mason. 10% came from our vineyard here in uh, the Hill Country, uh, well, here in, in Fredericksburg. Um, of course, Drew is still in the Hill Country as well. So this, this clearly puts it at uh, Hill Country ABA at 80% and 20% Texas High Plains. So 60% Malbec, the other 40%, 20% Cabernet Sauvignon, and 20% Petit Verdot. So this was the year when people say, what was the year you used Cabernet in the, in the Raven? In, instead of just Petit Verdot, this is the year. So normally we- It was also in 2009, but that was- well, Yeah, yeah. So um, it just shocked me that you guys had a winemaker before me. Uh, they, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the, um, of, the, of the two components, the Cabernet, um, came from uh, Jet Wilmoth's Vineyard and the Petit Verdot came from Drew Talent. So, you know, Drew provided 70% of the blending components for this wine. Um, we provided 10 and uh, Jet Wilmoth provided 20. So that-, and, that it, and, and, yep. and Drew's Malbec has traditionally been kind of the backbone of this. Oh wine. yeah, it, it, I, it, 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 yes, it has. It really has. Um, and we, we still continue to use it. He grows very, very good Malbec. Um, he also does a stellar job with Petit Verdot. That's one of my favorite Petit Verdots, but don't tell him that. Um, the, uh, <laughs> so, um, anyway, I know, I know his wife watches this every once in a while, so Laura, shh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, as, as uh, you know, you and my brother joke about Petit, but Petit Verdot is, has been a wonderful blending grape for us, particularly from his vineyard. You know, that's, it gives it this dark, you know, it is, you know, Anc de Calmar, it is a dark, inky mm -hmm. wine, very rich. It is very rich. So I want to encourage everybody to start typing some questions. Um, I'm seeing a lot of things saying hello, hello, <laughs> out there in, in virtual land. But if you've got any questions about this wine, now's the time to ask about the program overall. And uh, as I alluded to earlier, yes, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, as I alluded to earlier, uh, we, we did send this off. If if you're out there, if you're one of the wine club members joining us, potentially joining us for the cruise in November up the Danube, um, it, one of the, this wine will be one of the featured wines there. Um, we've got a few other uh, storied surprises in, uh, for that cruise. Um, we're kind of hoping it goes through, but anyway, if it does, it'll be a, a wonderful thing. Yeah, I'm just looking forward to it. If we get to go, because we start in Budapest and then we get to go up to Vienna and then we get to go up through um, you know, ch touch Czechoslovakia and into Germany. It'll be wonderful. So, um, anyway, uh, the as far as that goes, the the fourteen. Um, what do you think about decanting, Joe and Rebecca? Did you guys get a chance, or did you open it? Oh, I think this is, this is a wine that um, that wants to be decanted. You know, this is this is a um, you know this is a wine that. Uh, the 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 aroma just gets darker and richer and the um, 
tannins kind of open up a little bit more as you after you've decanted it. Um, and I think decanting this wine for at least an hour, um, you know, and it, it, it would be, I think, in competition with with many of the great um, uh, New World Malbecs, and uh, it almost even has an older Bordeaux note to it. Yeah. yeah, so we um, we just got a question, Joe. Is there any reason uh, Ranger Hayes was chosen for the new name? Could you could you address that? Sure. Yes. So Ranger Hayes. Um, so we, um, you know, Raven, uh, you know, was is unique. It was describing a, a dark wine, as I mentioned earlier. It was, uh, you know, it was the Native American nickname for Sam Houston, and so we wanted wanted something that could kind of tie uh, tie this wine to the hill country. We were, we were trying to make a, you know, a, a powerful red wine in the Texas hill country. And, um, uh, Ranger John Coffee Hayes was the, um, Texas Ranger that had surveyed our property. Uh, and he's known for a, uh, famous, uh, shootout with the Comanche Indians at, uh, Enchanted Rock. Uh, and our, in our, uh, I want to say lifelong friend and sculptor, uh, Clay Dahlberg. Uh, if you look at the label on the Ranger Hayes, uh, that's, that's a, uh, engraving of one of his sculptures of, of Ranger Hayes, where he's, he's, uh, behind the rock with his rifle and he's got his, uh, he's got his pistol on the rock. Um, and so we put that on the label. And so it has, it has a lot of meaning to us from from both being in you know something that represents the hill country, something that um, you know represents um, you know the 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 uh, um, the mystique of the Texas hill country, um, you know that that pioneering, that that bravery, yeah. um, and so we yeah. we decided to put that on the bottle. So um, as a follow up question, just for me, out of sheer curiosity, this was not actually asked online. So. When John Coffee Hayes, when Ranger Hayes surveyed the property, um, does your, you know, how much did your dad pay for that? And does he still have the original bill of sale? <laughs> <laughs> John feels like he can say anything because harvest has started. <laughs> what? <sighs> <laughs> hey, I I know our producer is actually listening. Don't let Doc on this broadcast if he's oh, dialing in all of a sudden. He's dialing in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so anyway. John, there was something that I was noticing that I want you to kind of address and talk about. And I know we've talked about it before, but I was, you know, with these older wines, as we talk about how they start to lose color, this one really hardly has any color loss at all. I was holding it up against, you know, yeah. a white paper and looking at it and the meniscus and everything around the edge is still very, very dark. Um, is that because of the Petit Bordeaux? Is that because of the particular blend? What makes some wines lose more color than others? Wow. Well, sometimes men just have, have secrets about how they make wine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so color drop is actually a very big concern, especially when you're talking about five or more years in the, in the bottle. Um, the Petit Verdot certainly handles, uh, helps that, Rebecca, but the, the native tannins in the skins are the one thing that you want to bind with the color. So uh, we do at the very beginning of uh, maceration, post harvest, pre-ferment, when the grapes are in the tank macerating, we, we do a little uh, tiny little itty bitty trick to ensure that the tannins are not oxidized by the oxygen, but are binding with the, the color um, in there, the uh, anthocyanides. But, uh, yeah. And you would have done what, what we call a cold soak on some of this, yes. right? So part of the reason people got it so enamored with cold soaking uh, 20, 30 years ago, when it really started coming in vogue, is they noticed that the longer they allowed that, the, the richer the taste, the final product, the more color stable, the final product, and the uh, more depth of uh, tannin development on the final product. So the, the, by depth, I mean by um, forming those longer and longer chains, the, the fullness. So uh, what that is though, is it, it's allowing the, the tannins that exist in the skins to, to bind with the pigment in the skins. And you need, there's a particular enzyme that starts breaking that stuff down that you need to activate once it hits air. So um, by giving it a fairly oxygen-free environment at the very beginning, you ensure that, um, or by using some sacrificial tannins, like one of the tricks is taking shredded 
French or American oak staves that have been shredded up and throwing it in with the beginning soap. So they, um, they help oxidize the, those tannins, those short chain tannins in the wood actually bind with the oxygen first. So, or you can use uh, a skin tannins in addition of skin tannins. There are a few different things that you can do, but there are some, there's some pretty natural ways to do that. And so we, as part of our built-in protocol, it's just been that way. So that's, um, we will see very little color drop, but that a very good question, Rebecca, that is actually a concern on there. Another, um, another question about it was French or American oak, which one do you prefer? So, you know, we use both. And uh, to be honest with you, the American oak I love on, on some of the Bordeaux varietals. Malbec and Cabernet, I prefer French over American, but uh, Petit Bordeaux, I really enjoy either American or French on, um, you know, and Cab Franc can do very, very well with either. So to, that's just a very, I guess, a, um, neutral answer, I apologize, but my preference um, is uh, to match it with the varietal and from the vineyard, and that takes time. So my preference says, John, yeah. Could you talk about the, the tightness of the grain for, for people? Because I think that's interesting about French versus American oak and how so you kind of make that decision. You really want to put these folks to sleep tonight, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sure. So long time ago, let's start like James Michener. Back in back in the Pleiocene, <laughs> here's this amoeba. Um, so the uh, the tightness of the grain does play a trick. American, the tightness of the grain. Basically, think this is a as a um, a plank of oak, and it's the growth ring that you would see in a cross section of that wood. That's the rings where or the the grains we're talking about the rings. So French oak, um, what we're using today, actually started growing during the mini ice age from the 15 to 1800s. And so it was a very much cooler region up there where some of these mature trees are coming from. So that's a much, much tighter grain. Same with Eastern Europe. You know, prior to the October revolution in, in Russia, uh, back in the um, you know, early 1900s, we won't say 1917, because I'm not sure of the year. Um, the, but prior to that, the French were actually getting oak from Russia because it grew in such a cold environment. There was such tight grain. But, you know, for 40 years, they couldn't get a hold of that. So they actually started delving into their own forests more and more. And that's the advent. So that we, we've taken advantage of that, too. American oak actually doesn't have as tight a grain. It's still fairly tight grain. And that white oak does very wonderful in barrels. But the American oak grains are, are a little looser. So you actually don't want to age. Uh, for a long time, if you don't want a heavy amount of toasted or oak flavoring in that wine, don't put in American oak for a long period of time because you get a lot up front. Uh, French oak is a, a little bit over a long period of time. So that, there's the gist of the balance. Um, somebody said here, you chill the Raven, uh, usually red wine, not chilled. Can you advise on what to chill and, and how? So I chill all of my wines to the same temperature. I like whites and reds down in the low 50s, period, end of statement yeah. before serving. Um, it is not room temperature in Texas is not cave temperature. <laughs> Just in case yeah. you're curious. So Rebecca, you've been sitting there very quietly. So we, you know the question's coming. It's that time of the evening. Food. My second favorite topic. I know. So this one, the raven is always mine with steak. Steak and raven is my deal. Big hunk of red meat with Raven every single time. With this particular Raven, I think that with like blue tree, blue cheese crumbles melted over my steak would be fantastic. That's, that's my Raven answer every single time. It's a big hunk of red meat with blue cheese crumbles. Okay, before I get to Joe, I'm gonna address this question directly to a gentleman by the name of Billy Yule. Billy, I did get there and I did answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> he's saying i've almost got there but not quite so i'm not going to give away all the secrets but but most of them so joe step uh, by step how you make each wine john what oh gosh we no i don't want to bore everybody to death um so joe what what do you uh, what do you pair with this wine sir i think just going on the uh original theme of this wine uh, you could, you could, you could, you could, you could, as Rebecca said, you could do a nice steak. You could, and you could do it sort of in the Argentina sense, maybe with a very mild sriracha sauce, um, yes. just because I think this has a very dark yeah. that, would, that would hold up to it. I think, I think you're right on that one, you know, or a chimichurra, you know, a little chimichurra. Chimichurra. Oh, chimichurra. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
that that would be excellent excellent no to answer the question that just came propping up do i ever use uh, uh barrels from bourbon distilleries no i do not um but all. they use ours yes they do and so do some very wonderful scotch people have gotten some texas uh oak as well um so the i just um no no bourbon barrels in the wine but yeah that's where i'm going to stop my opinion um food for me you know when i taste this wine and you guys are hitting it on the head i i don't know if i can go one better or not but i'm going to try um i'm going to go with rack of lamb so Ooh. yeah and i'm going to go a little little more irish on you guys so which most people won't understand but little lamb with haggis no, that's Scottish. You really? Oh, sorry. Nobody is going to eat anything out of a stomach. <laughs> the Scots potatoes. are weird. Potatoes <laughs> is what he's going to say. <laughs> no, Cheetos. No, Cheetos. I apologize to all the Scottish people that are watching. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. They'll just uh, if you really want a good insult, let get a Scotsman to insult you. You will feel thoroughly satisfied by the insult. <laughs> trust me. Um, the uh, the. In addition to the lamb, I would say both a mint sauce and an onion sauce. So that ooh, think, mint sauce would be good. Yeah. So I, I think that would be a great pairing there. Um, so we've got new comments here. I think hopefully I haven't started a, a no haggis. Yeah, Billy is also saying no haggis. <laughs> uh, uh, I say, you know, and of course we get somebody that says this glass of wine pairs well with a second. <laughs> and a third. I love that. That's wonderful. That's exactly. wonderful right now with everything that's going on. I love yeah. that. That's, it does. That's up there with the by the pool wine. And what's the other one? Um, the, oh yeah, right. The, um, so somebody wants to speak to the heavy bottle and the label and why, why we chose to do it this way. So the heavy bottle, we, because um, it, it really stands out, it is really literally, you pick that bottle up even when it's full and you're like, oh, that, that seems like a good value. It just, that's one of the reasons you use a heavier glass. It's fancy. And fancy. So Joe, why the, uh, why the, why the silk screen? You know, I think we, uh, at the time, you know, this, this, this wine um, was just so, it, it, it stayed that way, just so, so dark and so rich. And I think it, it represents the very best of what Texas can do in terms of grape growing and and um, and wine production, and so it it we in a unofficial sense have considered it our flagship wine, and so um, you know we really wanted this 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 bottle to um, um, you know really really stand out as a as a symbol of that. Yeah, I uh, you know. Um not not to, to lament back to the perceived value of a heavier glass but that is one thing when you really when you pick that up you, we want people to understand that this we put a lot of weight behind this that's the thing it's uh you know we, we really that's one of the reasons you, you do that so you, it's our way of letting you know without directly speaking to you that this is something we really believe in so okay so i need to before i forget mention friday's wine again i don't think we we mentioned it earlier but uh, Friday is the 2018 Petite Syrah. And Rebecca, have we sent that out in the yep. wine club? It's oh, that's new. right, it's brand new. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us tell us why you chose it. Why, why was it chosen, Rebecca? Because Petite Syrah is fantastic. It's amazing. And, it's, and this particular Petite Syrah, like usually when we do a Petite Syrah, it's almost all, if not all, our estate Petite Syrah. And it's very near and dear to our hearts, even though Brett hates harvesting the Petite Syrah every year. He complains about it, but it's fantastic. It's just, it's, it does wonderfully. And it's got such flavor and such rich tannin and it's super dark. And I always tell people that if you, it's one of those wines where if you drink a glass of it, your uh -huh. mouth is purple yeah. and that's nothing to be ashamed of. That's how you can spot your people. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. It is very dark. Well, you know, the, the, the Petite Syrah, so you guys get to try it first. Um, so I'm very excited about it. Yes, I have tried it before we bottled. I have actually not tried this wine since we bottled it last spring. So, yeah, so I'm kind of looking forward to, to uh, Friday as well. And the, um, so next week, our lineup for next week, do you have that in front of you? Rebecca, if not, I have it. Um, you got it. I okay, so next week um, is our 19th week. And so uh, to celebrate, um, we're going to be doing a, I, this is a twist and I want everybody to bear with me. It's a library release of our Sanye. 
the 2016 rosé. That'll be fun. Um, it is. I tasted it last week, and I want everybody to be assured that um, I hate to. I don't know how to say this without sounding really weird, but we know. How about if I use the pejorative "we"? We know how to make rosé, and that rosé you will be be very stunned with. That it's one of those things. Yeah, Texas makes great rosé. Yes, yes, we do. People are always asking, you know, how long can you age that? Do you need to drink it right away? And we suggest that you, you know, rosés are meant to be consumed when they're young. But I think this is going to be a really great example of showing you how they age, and they're just they're still fantastic if they're made in a certain way. Um, they can age very well. And this one in particular, I think it shows beautifully. It's, you know. Somebody just asked, if the cruise cancels, can we buy the wine that's set aside for it? Well, yes, but, but it's already over in Europe. So <laughs> it's on its way. Contact Alma Waterways. And right. see <laughs> you see if they have a clearance. <laughs> but, yeah. um, so, so next week, Monday will be the Sanye, the 2016. I'm very, that is actually going to be an interesting wine to try. Wednesday next week will be the 2017 Carignan from Ready Vineyards. Yeah. That wine is stellar. Those, those are one of the three C's that we bottled those, um, the Carignan, Senso, and Cunha, just to have samples of those wines by themselves to give somebody a little, it's more like an education series for us because we wanted people to understand, yes, we get to use these. You know, winemaking team, the winemakers may understand what it is, but a lot of people don't get to try these individual wines by themselves. They're usually blended with other things. Well, these components stood up an, a well so much up so on their own that we decided to, to bottle a couple hundred cases of each. So we'll be trying that one. And then on Friday, um, it will be another library release, the 2016 Culinaria. Uh, Ooh. He yeah. actually thought was all gone. Right. He there was no more of that. And Brett found about 120 bottles of it. Yeah, he-, he In he, the he warehouse. Found, he found where I was hiding things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> he went back there and looked. No. Yeah, it, it, there, it was back with the uh, other library wines. So yeah, it was, uh, it was, we were really excited about that. Um, let's see. I'm just looking for other questions. Uh, should we prepare I'm say, for Friday? Yes, I'll sir. say, I'll say one, I'll say, I got two things to say. Yes. Um, number, number one, uh, in, in just because they've, they've been good, uh, good friends to us. Um, the, the culinario is, I think, is doing their their restaurant weeks in August here in San Antonio, and I believe they're doing um, curbside pickup for a lot of their um, a lot of the restaurants. And um, um, I, I know that we're we're working on having our, our culinaria with with a lot of those uh, curbside pickups with a lot of the restaurants. There's the delicious culinaria that we just bottled, and and some of our older culinaria too. And then the, be the best news uh, that, that really made me excited before uh, I started this pod uh, virtual tasting is that uh, my eight-year-old beat my father in golf today. So uh, I just have to say, Nathan, way to go. Cheers, Nathan. That's great. Isn't that like the second time? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, so what you're saying is Doc's game slipping? <laughs> you know what? I think it's cleats. He needs better cleats. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome you know and i think i think if i rib him too much about the golf he's probably gonna fire me uh, so <laughs> all right so yeah so everybody thanks for joining us again for another wonderful tasting um we appreciate you letting us into your hearts and homes and uh and spending a little bit of time with us we hope we're able to bring you a little levity to your evening and a, and a glass of good wine always so cheers to everyone good health and great cheers wine. cheers